on this week's Vaticano, Pope Francis calls for an end to the violence rocking the Middle East. The Pontifical Council for the Family prepares the way for a papal visit with the elderly, and we speak to the head of Rome's Korean College ahead of the Pope's coming trip to his nation. Also, the Pontifical Council for Promoting the New Evangelization looks forward to an event this fall on the joy of the Gospels. This bioethics expert takes a look at the risks of patenting human beings. All this plus we join a once-a-year procession in the streets of Rome, and this Spaniard makes a cycling pilgrimage across Europe. Stay tuned and find out why on this week's Vaticano. During his weekly Sunday Angelus, Pope Francis lamented the massive exodus of Christians in the Iraqi city of Mosul the day before. While he was speaking of them, the last of the Christians were fleeing the city where Christian communities have lived for almost 2,000 years. Now, forced to either convert to Islam, pay a protection tax or be killed, Pope Francis made an appeal on their behalf. I learned with concern the news coming from the Christian communities in Mosul, in Iraq, and in other parts of the Middle East, where they, from the very beginning of Christianity, lived with their fellow citizens, offering a significant contribution to the good of society. Today, they are persecuted. Our brethren are being persecuted, they are driven out, they must leave their homes without being able to bring anything with them. I want to express my closeness and my constant prayer to these families and these people. Dear brothers and sisters who are persecuted so much, I know how much you suffer. I know that you are stripped of everything. I am with you in faith in the one who has conquered evil. And to you all here in the square and those who follow us through television, I extend the invitation to pray for these Christian communities. I also urge you to persevere in prayer for situations of tension and conflict that persist in different parts of the world, especially in the Middle East and in the Ukraine. May the God of peace inspire in all a genuine desire for dialogue and reconciliation. Violence is not conquered with violence. Violence is conquered with peace. Let us pray in silence, asking for peace. Preghiamo in silenzio, chiedendo la pace, tutti in silenzio. Mary, Queen of Peace, pray for us. Church officials now estimate around 450,000 Christians are left in Iraq, down from around 1.5 million just under a decade ago. In many of his public and private audiences, Pope Francis has spoken out against what he calls a throwaway culture that neglects both its young and its old. This coming September 28th, he has decided to host tens of thousands of elderly people in an open-air audience in St. Peter's Square. The care given to the elderly, like that of children, is an indicator of the quality of a community. When the elderly are tossed aside, when the elderly are isolated and sometimes fade away due to a lack of care, it is an awful sign. This meeting is necessary to proclaim to the world that uh, elderly are inside the church, are inside the society, uh, against this awful sign that uh, are visible in society today. The encounter will consist of an audience and mass with the Pope. It will be the first specific meeting with the elderly of this pontificate. 
that will come, uh, we think, uh, uh, many thousands of uh, elderly and uh, grandparents from Italy, from Europe, and maybe uh, probably some uh, uh, representatives from uh, uh, the other nation of uh, the world. But uh, uh, many other grandparents and many other elderly um, uh, will see the, the meeting on the TV on the, and, and on the internet because uh, this uh, will be shared all over the world by the media. And so this is the first time, it's very important for us and for the family of the world to present, to put a light on the, this age of life. Those interested in attending can visit the Council's website, www.family.va, for more information on how to sign up. Just weeks remain before Pope Francis travels to South Korea, so we decided to pay Rome's Pontifical Korean College a little visit. There, the rector gave us a bigger picture of the expectations back at home. Catholics, as well as the whole Korean population, are waiting for the Pope's visit with joy. They want to welcome him with joy. The President of the Republic, as well as the ex-President, have invited the Pope to visit Korea and Pope Francis accepted this invitation. When these news were made public, there was much joy. Just like the rest of the world, the people of Korea have seen he's a good man, a symbol of hope and a way forward. The whole world, even in Korea, there is an economic crisis and there are still difficulties. So the whole world was looking for a guide, a pastor. Also, the Korean people have seen in him the image of a good pastor. So the shepherd will give us hope and will show he is walking side by side with the people of Korea. This is his third voyage abroad. A year ago, he was here in Rio. He'll be leading young people like these in prayer again for what's called Asian Youth Day from August 14 to the 18. South Koreans are also looking forward to events like the canonization of 124 Korean martyrs. There is hope that they will inspire still more missionary zeal over there. The Catholic Church is growing in South Korea. Each year there are over 100,000 people baptized. Just last year, if I remember well, there were 120,000 baptized. Where does this miracle come from? I don't know. Nobody knows. But it's growing, and so many non-Catholics are also in favor of the Church in South Korea. There are so many non-Catholics who tell others they are Catholic, and for me, that is a miracle. The Pope has published two apostolic and exhortation letters, Lumen Fide and Evangelii Gaudium. So many young people have read Evangelii Gaudium. They have read this Evangelii Gaudium to find values to better live in this modern-day world. They were looking for this, and they found it here. But also non-Catholic Korean youths have bought and read this Evangelii Gaudium or joy of the Gospels. It is also hoped that the trip will open a new path of dialogue between South and North Korea. Just a month before the important Synod on the Family in October, an international conference on evangelization is set to take place here in Rome. Based on Pope Francis' apostolic exhortation, The Joy of the Gospel, the aim is to find better ways of reaching people with the Gospel message. We're going to study a little the pastoral aspects of conversion. What is the mission of the Church? What is the role of the family? What is the way of evangelization in big cities? We're also going to try to do a whole reflection on those aspects of life that influence directly the communication of the gospel, like the challenges of social networking sites and the problem of the family within the context of evangelization and what is the role of culture and enculturation. So it's a whole spectrum with many important aspects that we take from the exhortation so that we can help put it into practice in different pastoral actions. 
And it's going to be exciting. What we're going to do is we're going to reflect on particular themes of the apostolic exhortation, really in view of the pastoral renewal of the church in light of the magisterium of Pope Francis. And it's an initiative that we're so excited about. It's open to all pastoral workers, priests, religious, deacons, the lay faithful, all of whom share most closely in the work of the bishop to discern how to respond to Christ's constant call to us to proclaim the gospel with ever new missionary energy and zeal and Christian joy. It's interesting to take the following into account. Very few times does Pope Francis speak about the new evangelization directly. But when one looks at the exhortation, one sees that he is showing the path, especially because Pope Francis, more than speaking on new evangelization, it's his attitude, his style, his closeness, that wish to be with the poor, the welcome that he gives to all people, his dialogue, his smile, that he has given to everyone. With all of this, he's telling us, it's not about talking, but rather to live a reality of being close, of going out to encounter people. He tells us that the church needs to be a church that goes out. This means we have to have the initiative, we have to search. It's a church with open doors. So what we're going to do is we're going to be gathering these people from all over the world. And we're going to be helping them. It's a very much of a, a pastoral initiative. So how is it that they can take what Pope Francis has shared with us in this beautiful apostolic exhortation, and how can they transpose it to their own particular circumstance, in their own unique parish situation, school situation. So really it's how do we assist people to take this beautiful document and make it a concrete pastoral project for their work every day. La nueva evangelización, más que un concepto, for the new evangelization, it is the spirit that must encourage the fulfillment of the church's mission. And this is what we need to understand, because it's very difficult for many people to understand what the church received as her mission over 20 centuries ago. Today we say new evangelization. So what is the novelty? That's one of the aspects that we will also try to develop so that we can see what the Pope says, which is, no, the important thing is evangelizing. The novelty is the spirit that we need to put into it to achieve that duty. It's having full trust in the Lord, who is the one who acts in the church, not us. We need to go out of ourselves so that we don't fall into self-reflection, which is just talking about what we think and what we want, and forgetting that it's the Lord who acts in the church and who saves us. More information on the September 18 to 20 conference can be found at the Pontifical Council for Promoting the New Evangelization's website. How to protect the human being from becoming a commercial product has become a key issue in the bioethics debate. Here at Rome's Human Life International, they have been following the trends that seem to be leading to the patenting of man. Here we have a serious problem. Really, you cannot have a right to patent a human being. You, have, you do not have a right to patent a human being for several reasons. Number one, because it's immoral to create a human being in, in a laboratory. I'm not going to discuss the different uh, scientific, scientific procedures that can lead to the creation, quote unquote, of a human being in a laboratory, but all those means are immoral because a human being has the right to be generated by a father and a, and a mother in the womb of the mother, a couple that's united in, in a natural permanent marriage. 
So we are first attacking the natural rights of the child to be properly conceived. That's number one. Number two, proper, uh, property of a child is a form of slavery. It is a patrimony of humanity, a moral patrimony of humanity, shared uh, by all human beings that slavery is not moral, that nobody has the right to own a human being. So in this particular case, uh, the ownership through a patent will be a form of slavery. So it has to be utterly rejected. Another important issue is human cloning. If scientists succeed in creating cloned human beings, questions arise. What are their rights and are they considered equals? Human beings have a right to be conceived by a mother and a father united in marriage. At the same time, something very important to underline, that if in the future human beings are conceived in, in a way of talking, and they are generated, they are created, through cloning, those human beings have the same rights as any other human being because the morality or immorality of the conception of a child does not change his rights as a human being. That's obvious. A child can be born out of wedlock, could be born due to the tragedy of a rape, or even worse, uh, to an incestuous relationship. But all of those children that have a sad origin have the same rights as all other children. So if we, start, we, we will start seeing walking children of cloning, those children will ha have the same rights because God infuses souls to all human beings without checking on the way those children have been conceived. Advances in technology come with a simultaneous discussion as to morality, ethics, and human rights. It's the Catholic Church accompanying humanity in the 21st century. This is the Feast of Nuantri, or Our Feast in Roman slang. It's the Marian procession of the neighborhood of Trastevere, celebrated on the first Saturday after the Feast of Our Lady of Carmel. It's believed that fishermen prayed to her in the 16th century, when they were in difficulty, and she gave them a hand. This is like the mother procession of Rome. They say that we, from Trastevere, are the real Romans. So they call it the Feast of Noantri. It's a term which means us, ours. It's a very old tradition. Also, each year they change the dress of Our Lady, which is donated. It dates back several centuries. The procession is always a way of getting close to God, both the religious and the civil aspects. Sometimes the civil aspect awakens feelings. I just heard someone say, I can't hear this Ave Maria song because it moves me. So these moments that are a bit folkloric are always a way of getting close to the faith. This started because in times of war, the Tiber River, which finishes in the sea, it started because there were fishermen who were having difficulties and Our Lady saved them. That's why she is also called Our Lady of the River. Our Lady of Mount Carmel is July 16, but they celebrate her today because it's Saturday. Now they'll take her in procession by foot, and they'll take her to this church over here. Uh, what's the name? Oh yes, uh, St. Crisogono. Then Sunday of next week, they take her by boat across the river, where there will be some firefighters. I come here because it forms part of my life. 
I'm 68 years old, and I always come here every year because I've left my roots here. I've left my heart here. It's important for the people of Trastevere. It's important for us. It's our inheritance. We walk and go forward with it. It forms part of us Trastevereni. It's part of us. It's part of our family. I feel as if my family were here. My mother, my father. I was small and would be here with them. It's something marvelous. They can't let it die. But rather, they should promote it more. Because it just can't die. The statue was taken out from the church of St. Agatha and carried down the streets of Trastevere. The crowd kept growing as thousands gathered and prayed the rosary for her protection and intercession. She was taken to the church of San Francesco a Ripa, where the parish priest came out to greet her. Father Giulio, the parish priest of St. Agatha, helped lead the procession. I see that there is a big flow of young people, so many of them, even those carrying the statue. There is a great sensitivity towards Our Lady on the part of the youth, without neglecting the presence of so many people who are traditionally linked to Trastevere and who participate in this feast. At the end of the procession, right before the statue was taken into the church of St. Crisogono, a band of the Italian military greeted Our Lady by playing the trumpets. Today, another procession will take place in which the same statue is put on a boat across the river Tevere. This Spaniard was a professional cyclist for five years. Now he's a Spanish national police officer, a Guardia Civil. He recently decided to pay homage to his grandparents who lived close to Spain city, Santiago de Compostela. And he's doing it on his bike. He's currently doing a bicycle pilgrimage from Rome all the way to Spain, Santiago de Compostela, a total of 3,600 kilometers in just 21 days with two days rest. Last year I did a pilgrimage from Pola de Holanda to Santiago, around 275 kilometers in one day. And there I realized from the first moment every thought that comes to your mind. In this case, feelings towards grandparents, especially towards one whose name I had inherited, Augustine, because he died while I was in Italy, so I wasn't able to go to his funeral. So many things. You feel tranquility, inspiration, and I don't know, sometimes it's hard to find words to describe how one really feels during a pilgrimage. This man accompanied him during the first few kilometers of the trip, which he began on July 14. He has played the main role because he has a real capacity of initiative and management, which is really impressive. He came up with the idea, he worked on all the necessary steps of getting sponsorship and help, of organizing the route and getting the contacts. I've just been the catalyst. I could encourage him and I stimulated him. I encouraged him that what he was doing should not be something just impersonal, but rather something public. Because I thought it could be very beautiful to unite his work in Rome with his Spanish origin, his devotion to Our Lady of the Pilar in Zaragoza, to the Apostle St. James in Compostela. I see there is a common denominator between his job as a Guardia Civil and his past as a professional cyclist with his faith. Because Christian faith implies also all these virtues related to work, service to the others, forgetting to oneself, generosity, sacrifice. Things that are easily found as a common denominator in the work of service of a Guardia Civil. Which we will never be grateful enough for what they do for us in silence and in a hidden way as well as the work of a cyclist and of a priest, whose work is that of service. Before taking off, Agustin got a special blessing from Pope Francis at the end of his general audience on June 4 at St. Peter's Square. I had the privilege to attend the general audience and to be able to have access to the kissing of the hand. There I told Pope Francis about this pilgrimage, and what impacted me the most was his attention. In each moment he listened to me from the beginning to the end, and it's something I will not forget. I want to stress that what will accompany me back during this pilgrimage, around my neck and under my outfit, so I don't think it will be visible, will be my rosary, blessed by the Holy Father, 
and I think it will help me a lot. Agustin's ride also marks the 800th anniversary of St. Francis of Assisi's own pilgrimage to Santiago.